I need that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here this morning. And today I'm going to be talking to you guys about some fun stuff that we've been doing uh, with nanopore sequencing to address the threat of carbapenem resistant gram negative organisms. So greater than 700,000 people around the world die from antibiotic resistant infections. And one of the most significant are carbapenem resistant organisms. And they become, one of the mechanisms where they become uh, resistant to carbapenems is uh, by producing carbapenemase enzymes that uh, cleave the amide, uh, the amide bond of the beta-lactam ring of most uh, beta-lactam antibiotics, including the carbapenems, rendering them inactive. So carbapenemase production is one of the primary mechanisms driving carbapenem resistance around gram, among gram negatives in the US, and so they're more aggressively targeted by antimicrobial stewardship and infection control programs. And so these carbapenemase producers are really a triple threat because they're increasing in prevalence globally where they cause high morbidity and mortality. They're highly mobile, so they're usually, the gene encoding the carbapenemase gene are usually on plasmids that can be shared between different gram-negative species and genera, as well as they're usually flanked by insertion sequences or carried within transposons, which allow those genes to jump around to other plasmids or to the chromosome of these organisms. And lastly, they're usually multi-drug resistant. So not only are they resistant to most of the beta-lactam agents, they also carry resistance genes to many other classes of antimicrobials. And this can be on the same plasmid or within success, where the plasmid comes into a successful multi-drug resistant strain, um, producing these very scary antimicrobial susceptibility testing profiles that we encounter in the clinical lab, where there are very few uh, or limited options for treatment that are left. So how do we apply nanopore sequencing to address this threat? Well, I'm going to go over three different scenarios where we've applied this um, in my research lab so far. One of them is applying metagenomic next-gen sequencing from rectal swabs to detect antibiotic-resistant organisms, such as carbapenem-resistant organisms, as well as applying whole genome sequencing in outbreak investigations or for uh, interesting clinical cases, or to use uh, real-time resistance gene detection to predict, predict therapeutic outcomes. And so the first scenario I'm going to go over is uh, the application of uh, metagenomic next-gen sequencing. And you heard a little bit about this yesterday, so just briefly, metagenomic next-gen sequencing is a method for identification and genomic characterization of bacteria, fungi, parasites, and viruses without the need of, for priori knowledge directly from the clinical specimen. So from a clinical specimen, let's say CSF or a sputum specimen, we isolate all the nucleic acid present, and then we will uh, sequence that in parallel. And what happens is you get amplification and sequencing of both host human DNA as well as your microbial genome. And so what metagenomic next-gen sequencing does is that in a single modality that's hypothesis three, free, culture independent, we can overcome many of the limitations of current standard of care testing that we apply in the clinical microbiology lab, where right now we, uh, physicians usually uh, order a battery of tests to attempt to establish a diagnosis where we could apply metagenomic next-gen sequencing, uh, a single method to uh, attempt to achieve that diagnosis. And so there have been many successful applications of metagenomic next-gen sequencing in the literature so far, and this really came to the forefront when Charles Chu's group uh, published this actionable diagnosis of neuroleptospirosis in the New England Journal of Medicine. And since then, we've seen a whole bunch of different case cases or retrospective analyses that have been published from mostly central nervous system sources, but other uh, clinical sources that have allowed for detection of rare, novel, and atypical infectious etiology. And although most of these publications have used the Illumina sequencing, um, what we're starting to see is more publications on utilizing nanopore sequencing and its real-time analysis, which allows us to decrease this turnaround time greatly. Where right now, on average, with Illumina sequencing, we're about 48 hours, 48 hour turnaround time, whereas with nanopore, we can get a turnaround time within six hours. So here's an example of a diagnosis of JC polyomavirus that was done um, with, uh, in a publication by Steven Salzberg and Carlos Pardew at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, from a CSF specimen, they were able to make the diagnosis of JC polyomavirus. 
But one of, there are many hurdles that still lie ahead of us to actually widely adopt metagenomic next-gen sequencing in the clinical microbiology lab. And one of those things are um, that the majority, the great majority of the reads, and so in this specimen we had greater than 26 million reads, and 97% of those actually were host human reads. And it was only 0.03% of those reads that were actually the JC polyoma virus. So we're really looking for a needle in a haystack. And so those human host reads actually uh, can hinder our um, detection in the clinical lab. So that's from sterile sources, and that's what most people have initially applied metagenomic next-gen sequencing. But we set out to ask, well, what about from non-sterile sources? What about from a complicated specimen source like rectal swabs? Uh, can we apply metagenomic next-gen sequencing? And so we took 10 remnant rectal swabs that we received in the clinical microbiology lab, and we received rectal swabs for uh, surveillance for antimicrobial resistant organisms. This is actually the highest volume test that we receive in the clinical lab. And um, so what they're looking for are vancomycin-resistant enterococci or for multidrug-resistant gram-negatives, such as carbapenem-resistant organisms. And so what we set out to do is, can we compare our culture-based methods that we currently apply compared to metagenomic next-gen sequencing of those same specimens? And also, can we compare Illumina to nanopore sequencing? And so right now, what we do for standard of care is we use chrome... Uh, Chromagar for the detection of VRE, and then we use a direct McConkie plate method. So McConkie is a selective plate for gram negatives, and we put down carbapenems to look for carbapenem resistant organisms. And so the first thing that stood out to us was that, so although it's a more complicated specimen with a lot more background, we actually get a lot less host human uh, contamination. So here's uh, highlighted in orange are, is the percent of human reads overall. And so ironically, it was kind of easier to interpret our results than it is for, from CSF specimens. And then here's just a couple examples that I'll walk through in terms of our culture-based results compared to metagenomic next-gen sequencing results. And so in this sample, it was positive for vancomycin-resistant enter, uh, Enterococcus faecium, and, and then on our plates, we were able to detect this meropenem-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And metagenomic next-gen sequencing, we could largely replicate what our culture results were revealing. So we had the great majority of our reads being this Pseudomonas originosa that we identified on our culture plates, as well as we were able to detect the VRE and the VAN-A resistance determinant that provides vancomycin resistance uh, to this organism. Here's a second example where it was positive for VRE, but we had no growth on our McConkie plate. So there was no gram negatives present. And we're wondering, this is a rectal swab. There's plenty of gram negatives present, correct? Well, it turns out that the, the abundance of the microbiome in this patient was actually gram positive and, re and actually reflected so in our metagenomic sequencing, where the predominant organism was the VRE that we were detecting. And so our hypothesis is, is that these are usually patients that are high-risk patients in our ICUs that have been on broad-spectrum antibiotics, and so we likely uh, selected for a shift in the microbiome to be more gram-positive, um, uh, to be more predominant in gram-positive organisms. And so this is our nanopore sequencing results. And so we could show that we could do exactly what we did with Illumina sequencing with nanopore. But it was even cooler because we could show the distribution of the organisms over time as we sequenced was really was very similar. So whether we started it at 10 minutes in the sequencing run or an hour later, the distribution of what we were seeing during real-time analysis was the same. So to me, as a clinical microbiologist, that's exciting because this, to me, as a diagnostic tool, it has a lot more relevance that I could say within 10 minutes of starting the sequencing run or what, an hour that we can actually have a diagnosis within those first couple minutes. Whereas with Illumina right now, we're waiting uh, 24 hours to get our sequencing results to analyze them. And this is just showing the distribution of um, the Illumina sequencing and Minion sequencing, where largely this, the classification of the organisms that we are encountering was largely, largely the same when we were using Kraken for analysis. And so here's my last example for the use of metagenomic next-gen sequencing, where we had a positive for VRE, 
And on our carbapenem-resistant plates for selecting for our carbapenem-resistant organisms, we found a KPC-producing Kleb Nebo. So KPC is one of those carbapenemase producers. And we also applied a PCR for detection of that KPC gene directly from the rectal swab. And we, it, it had a crossing point of 14.1. So this specimen was very heavy in that KPC gene. It was loaded with that gene. And so we could demonstrate the same, again, the distribution of the organisms well using metagenomic next-gen sequencing. But what was most exciting to me, and this was two years ago when uh, Winston introduced me to nanopore sequencing, was that in 2.3 minutes of starting that sequencing run, I could say that that rectal specimen was positive for a KPC producer. There was KPC gene present there. And not only were we able to study the microbiome of these rectal swabs, but we were also able to study the resistome. And so we get so much more information uh, doing, uh, using metagenomic next-gen sequencing. So in summary, metagenomic next-gen sequencing, we found that it correlated well with culture-based results, even among high background specimens. We found a relatively low number of uh, human reads among rectal swabs, and Illumina and nanopore se sequencing correlated very well. And we were able to detect resistance genes, but with MinION, the time to detection was within minutes. And we're also to go back and detect the genetic context of that uh, resistance gene. So that was my example of metagenomic next-gen sequencing. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit to whole genome sequencing. And so just to remember, so this is not direct from the specimen. This is from a cultured organism in, in culture. So it's a pure culture. And we're extracting the genomic DNA. And that what we're trying to do is sequence it and assemble its genome as well as its plasmids. And so plasmids become really important when studying carbapenemase producers as they're usually mediated or spread through, through plasmids. And so nanopore sequencing allows us to study that a lot easier than Illumina because oftentimes they have a lot of repetitive sequence regions that are hard, hard to assemble where we can assemble them readily using nanopore sequencing. And so to, to uh, show how we've applied this um, for carbapenem resistant res organisms, I'm going to go over two different cases. So one is uh, the use of whole genome sequencing as a, re a replacement to pulse field gel electrophoresis for outbreak investigation or for a cool clinical case, which I'll discuss. And the second is to predict um, phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing results uh, detecting resistance genes. So this is the first case of a 44-year-old male with cirrhosis who returned to the U.S. after a two-month visit in India, which included a week-long hospitalization after a fall. So he presented to the first hospital with bacteremia and pneumonia with right-sided paranomotic effusion requiring chest tube drainage with a highly susceptible Klebsiella pneumonia. So it was very susceptible to all the agents we were testing. Um, so he was discharged home and completed a total of 27 days of antibiotics. However, however, 20 days later, he presented it again to another hospital with fevers, seizures, and respiratory distress. And at this hospital, um, the, initially from the clinical specimens, they were isolating this highly susceptible Klebsiella pneumonia consistent with the first hospitalization. However, what happened throughout his course is that we kept on isolating these Klebsiella pneumonia isolates. However, the AST profiles varied from being completely susceptible to extensively drug resistant and everything in between. Phenotypically, they looked identical in culture, just their growth characteristics, except some of them were um, what we call positive for the string test. Now, this is a highly complex test that we use in the clinical lab, where we take a, a loop and we touch the surface of the organism, and if that strand extends past five millimeters, it's positive for this virulent strain. And so we noticed that some of them were uh, string test positive, and this was consistent with the clinical presentation because this patient it was found to have both kidney and brain abscesses as well. And so during the clinical case, the clinical team kept coming down to the lab and asking, what's going on? Is it one strain with multiple plasmids that are gaining and losing them? Are subpopulations thriving depending on the antibiotic selective pressures? Or do we have multiple strains causing this patient infection? So we set out to do uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis, um, as well as um, sequencing of these isolates using both Illumina and Nanopore. And what we could show using all these methods is that we had two different strains present. One was this extensively drug-resistant strain that was the highly drug-resistant strain. And then a second was the more virulent strain um, clustering together. And we could show this clustering with all the different methods that we applied. <clears throat> 
But taking it a step forward with whole genome sequencing, we could do single nucleotide polymorphism analysis, where with Illumina, we got 2 to 15 SNPs initially uh, between related strains. Whereas with the nanopore data, it was a little bit more error prone. So we were seeing very many, a lot of SNPs, so it was difficult to analyze that at first. But we did use our Illumina data to correct our nanopore data, and we're able to get down to zero to four SNPs between the related strains with, Verta, with multiple rounds of pylon analysis. And so, based, so what does this SNP data provide to us? Well, it was interesting because we also did some environmental sampling in this patient's room. And we were trying to figure out, well, how is this patient contaminating? What is the source from the patient? And so we were able to see that the, it was most closely related to one of the sputum samples. And so it was likely through his res respiratory secretions that he was actually contaminating his room environment. And we were also able to discern how much these organisms were evolving throughout his hospitalization. And so um, this is just, again, showing that I love that with nanopore sequencing, we could detect these resistance genes so rapidly. And we could detect the two big resistance genes carried by that extensively drug-resistant strain, so the carbapenemase OXA181 and the ESBL, extended spectrum beta-lactamase gene, CTXM15, within 15 minutes of starting the run and as little as one minute for some of the isolates. We were also able to assemble these beautiful plasmids where these uh, um, genes, these AR genes, were being carried. And so we found the OXA181 was on this smaller called KP3 plasmid, and that the CTXM15 was on this uh, INC R plasmid, which was a multi drug resistant plasmid. But importantly, it was flanked by these insertion sequences. And we, what we found in the chromosome is that they, it, the CTXM15 gene jumped into a porin. Uh, gene and inactivated it, further resulting in further beta lactam resistance, just showing how much these genes can jump around with these insertion sequences. So with sequencing, we were able to really piece together the clinical scenario. Um, and so, especially with nanopore sequencing, so we had two, these two different strains, so this hypermucovirulent strain and this extensively drug-resistant strain here in, in red, and then the virulent strain in purple where it had one plasmid, and that plasmid carried all of its virulence genes, or most of the virulence genes. And then whereas this, the, the multi-drug resistance strain carried seven plasmids, which at one point we could see that um, the, the varying AST profiles was due to the acquisition of this OXA181 bearing plasmid while the patient was on meropenem. So due to selective pressures, it, was, it acquired that plasmid. We were also able to show other differences due to selective pressures of treatment that resulted in further resistance. So we were able to get a really nice picture in the end using whole genome sequencing. And then the last little thing that I'm going to go over with you very quickly is the use of uh, detection antibi antibi antibiotic resistance genes to predict phenotypic AST results. And I'll do this with a second case. And so this is a 64-year-old female who is status post-liver transplant presenting with septis, sepsis. Um, she was empirically initiated on vancomycin and meropenem. Her blood cultures ended up growing Klebsiella pneumoniae, and the AST results were available after 48 hours. And at that time, the isolate was found to be meropenem resistant. So the clinical team then asked for additional ASTs, including colistin, tigacycline, imipenem, as well as the novel beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, ceftazidime, avibactam. It's important to note because this uh, antimicrobial uh, only has activity against certain carbapenemase producers, but not against the metallobetalactamase producers. And so the team, based off of the, the AST results, at 48 hours had added clistin and um, amikacin to the regimen. And so this is what the AST result, the phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility results appeared like in the clinical lab. And this is results that were available, the standard at 48 hours, and then the additional ASTs at 72 hours. And in doing a retrospective analysis of whole genome sequencing in this isolate, within 28 hours, we could detect most of the resistance genes, acquired resistance genes, associated with the phenotypic uh, AST profile. And so technically, and all of these genes were detected within 10 minutes of starting the sequencing run. And so this is the, the, the um, actual therapeutic timeline. So at, the patient was initially started on meropenem, and then clistin and amikacin were added at 48 hours after the AST results were available. 
But potentially, if we would do real-time whole genome sequencing analysis of these isolates, especially in these critically ill patients when they become bacteremic, to get results a little bit quicker, we could have at 28 hours told them the resistance genes that were detected and could have predicted that they needed to add another agent at that point because it was positive for a, the carbapenemase producing NDM, and this is one of those metallobetalactamase producers. And so we could have also told them that ceftazidime avibactam won't have any activity against this isolate because it is one of those metallobetalactamase producers. And so what we wanted to do is take this a little st a step further, I'm going to go through this really quickly, is now to create a database breaking down these strains into their strain types, their plasmids, and then associating their antimicrobial resistance genes and virulence factors to the different strains and plasmids that we encounter. And we're starting out with our carbapenem resistant organisms in the that we've encountered over the last couple of years in the clinical lab. And so just quickly with our MLST typing, we found with just nanopore sequencing on its own, it's a little bit difficult because what you're looking for is specific mutations within these housekeeping genes to assign a multi locus sequence type. And due to the error rate of nanopore, we hypothesize that's what's happening is that we get a lot of unknown MLST types. But we're looking into this further to see how we can overcome this to more rapidly uh, call MLST types in these isolates. The plasmids are readily detected and easily assigned to incompatibility groups using the Center for Genomic Epidemiology using our raw assemblies from nanopore sequencing. It's really fun because there's a single contig assigned to the plasmid. And then, not, then we can figure out which plasmid is this INC a, AC plasmid and then go to our resistance gene result and detect which resistance genes were assigned to that plasmid. And so it allows for really easy analysis. And again, we're finding that it's really easy to detect our acquired resistance genes, but we're having issues with chromosomal mutations. Um, but we're trying to look through um, how we can make that better. So when you're looking for specific mutations in OMPK35 and 36, which are porins, that could potentially result in higher beta-lactam resistance, um, that it's difficult with the nanopore, um, some of the errors that we're encountering to discern what's true and what's not. And so here's an example of OMPK35. And if we focus in on this area here, we could see that, you know, within the homopolymers here that we're getting, it, it's missing calling one of the cytosines. But we do see these true mutations here. So can we figure out a way that we know when there's these true mutations occurring that are associated resist with resistance, which we believe we can do? And we've, we've also applied the, the epi to me uh, pipeline in real time when we're sequencing on our amino ion, and we love it. Again, within you know, seven minutes, we could detect most of the resistance genes uh, as we're whole genome sequencing our isolates. So in summary, nanopore sequencing has the potential for many different clinical applications, where metagenomic next-gen sequencing can be used as a diagnostic tool for infectious diseases. And we could also study the microbiome, the resistome, the virulome, and that real-time analysis of nanopore allows it, to be a more, to, allows it for more rapid turnaround times, and this is important as a diagnostic tool. Uh, whole genome sequencing provides a wealth of data on these clinical isolates where uh, we're able to um, sequence an entire plasmids and sequence around these repetitive regions that we can't do with short read sequencing. And lastly, we believe uh, that we can apply real-time sequencing analysis for antimicrobial resistance genes uh, to potentially predict AST profiles uh, more rapidly than standard methods. And we're working on a retrospective analysis right now, but uh, hopefully pr do some more prospective analysis in the future. And again, we're having a little bit of difficulty around chromosomal mutations where acquired resistance uh, genes are easily detected, but uh, we believe we can get around the chromosomal mutation issue. So thank you. It's a really, really rapid result. Oh, am I just coming on now? <laughs> um, OK, so we'll take a question from the app first. So we'll go with the top one. What do you think needs to happen before sequence-based resistance analysis becomes more, much more routine? 
Um, I guess we need to create well-curated databases first to start off with, um, and then second, there, there needs to be really well-validated um, studies that go out to show that we could truly replicate and know what the limitations of the methods are. I think sometimes, as we all know, detection of a resistance gene doesn't always mean that it's being expressed, right? And so that's where the difficulty lies. But the nice thing is, is with nanopore sequencing, we can kind of, we could start out there with just detection of resistance genes. And that's why I think creating the database of the associated phenotype with the resist, resist, resistance genes will be helpful to kind of overcome some of that. Um, but the proteomics analysis is really going to be where it's going to come from in the end, I think, if we could show that those genes are truly being expressed, and then I think that'll be a more reliable way in the end. But I do think it, even just detection of resistance genes um, are something that can come our way in the clinical lab. Fantastic. Have we got any questions from the floor? I apologize, it's a little bit bright. So, oh, one over there. Got boom mic coming in. Hello. Um, uh, hello. Oh, <laughs> hi. Uh, did you try any, any signal level um, polishing um, <laughs> programs to look at these uh, mutations? Uh, so we haven't yet, but that's something that we're planning to look at. Okay, fantastic. And we'll just take one more maybe from the app. Have you established any QC criteria for your MinIron runs? So minimal read depth, coverage, et cetera, for more routine assays? So we haven't gotten to that point yet. Right now we're still in the R&D phase. Um, uh, right now we're sequencing one isolate on a flow cell, which we're getting 1,100 times coverage. And so we're, we're trying to make that a little bit more uh, cost affordable for uh, clinical sequencing moving forward. And so at that point, I think once we get through the R&D step, we'll start to establish more QC parameters on you know what read coverage depth we want. But at this point, we haven't. So. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much. That was thank fantastic. you.